On Sunday at the icebreaker, I was particularly thanked for having got today's keynote speaker along because for the last few years, she has been a interested observer and commentator on this community, which I hope is a reasonable description, um, wrote a really good paper, which was published last year, I think, yeah, um, on how this community can do stuff that other more formal entities may not be able to do. Um, so highly recommended, very interesting to have insights from outside sort of the core first community. And it struck me that's actually a, a theme to all of our keynotes this week, that they are all people from you know, outside or on the, the, the edge of the um, incident response community telling us what we look like from the outside or what issues might be coming along to um, that we need to take a look at. So delighted to welcome Leonie Tanser from the fascinatingly named, once you get to the end of it, uh, Center of Excellence for Sci Science and Technology, so far so normal, and Public Policy, which is the twist that makes it a really interesting place to keep an eye on at the University College of London. Leonie. Brilliant. Wow, that was nerve wracking. Whew so many admin stuff before uh, I was able to speak to you. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for the introduction. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Leonie Tanzer. I'm a lecturer uh, at UCL. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really delighted to be here. Extremely intimidated as well. Um, certainly my lecture halls are not as big. And the CCTC talk that I did once uh, was in the morning at 11 a.m. and there was nobody there. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of new experience for me. Um, I know that the yesterday's keynote was outstanding, uh, so um, I was pretty much uh, working all night to improve my slides to make them just as fun as they can be considering the topic of my talk. Um, as you can imagine, governance is not the most sexy topic uh, you can envision, so uh, please bear that in mind and just laugh anyway. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to be talking about IoT governance. So that I want to start where basically yesterday's keynote ended. And uh, actually, I want to first say some of you might know me or have seen my name in your inbox. I feel like um, I've literally emailed all of c in the world. At least like that's how my weekend when I emailed and copy pasted all those messages to you felt. For those of you who replied, thank you very much. For those of you who didn't, not good. Um, so uh, the reason for that, as Andrew mentioned, was because we uh, conducted a study and still conduct a study about the CSERT community, which I'm not going to be talking about. Um, but uh, if you're interested in that work, uh, please have a look at our publication. Now, the other reason why I think I was invited is not just because I bothered the board so much over the last two and a half years, uh, but also because uh, I'm part of the so-called Petras Internet of Things Research Hub, or as it's now called, the Petras National Center of excellence. Now what that is, it's a very UK focused um, network of by now 11 universities who all research um, IoT aspects from technical aspects such as uh, computer scientists, electrical engineers to psychologists and social scientists like myself. So now that I've disclaimed that I'm not a techie, I hope you're still going to be uh, uh, nice and not judge me too much. But you might be wondering why have I been invited and what will I be talking about? So there's going to be four issues that I hope by the end of the talk, when you leave, are thinking about. And that's one, policy and governance, of course. The other one is the aspect of the human in this whole uh, dimension. Then also the difficulties of I actually governing and making policies around IoT, and then some approaches and initiatives that are on the way. So if I achieve that, um, that would be amazing. Now I do want to say I have been told not to lecture, which is really difficult because lecturing is in the title of my job. Um, so uh, if it's getting too boring, I will see it in your faces. I'm used to those faces by my students. So I will try to adopt. Very kind. Thank you very much for the loud laughters. Um, so let's start with the foundations because that's what academics do. So the internet of what? Um, I mean, it's not a big 
you know, issue for you guys. I'm sure you all either wear it, have it at home, or despise it. Um, nevertheless, it's actually an umbrella term that annoys us all, I assume. Um, it was actually a, probably a better term to call it this ubiquitous computing, which was actually coming back in the 90s. So the, the principle in itself is not that new. And actually, I will show you that the whole thing is not that new, also when it comes to regulation, despite the fact that I don't want to name names, but like some reports want to tell you. Um, what I really want to stress is, so despite the fact that it's a very technical aspect, I really want to emphasize that there is a relationship aspect, not just between the different systems from like the device, the communication network, the platform, but also to the human, because we wear it, we have it in our households. And uh, our dear godfather, Bruce Schneier, who will do a sign uh, sign uh, signing tomorrow, uh, basically calls it a new word instead of Internet of Things, he calls it Internet of Plus. Um, I actually think it's kind of interesting to basically emphasize that it's not just computers, but it's computers plus services that are on top of that, plus kind of the companies, many of which are you defending and trying to protect, plus us, the people who are using it. Now, there's a lot of risks, uncertainties, and opportunities. And actually, uh, the ones who have encountered me by now uh, over the last days will have realized that you know I'm all about facts, and that's why you have a lot of citations across the uh, uh, slides in a very long reference list. Um, so uh, you will realize that we don't really have a clarity of like the percentage of like how much risk is there actually. And that's really hard to quantify where we are now. But still, there's also a lot of opportunities which some people try to emphasize. But really, we don't know really what, you know, what we are facing in the future. And that's why we have the wonderful Internet of Shit. Um, if you have never seen it before, I really encourage you to have a look at this. Um, uh, it's kind of what the talk yesterday ended with, which was basically we tried to connect everything, and uh, sometimes it works out, most of the times it doesn't. Um, uh, but it still brings us sometimes joy. Now, I do want to bring one aspect, and that's what I ent entered uh, this slide uh, entered yesterday, because when um, Ken I I finished, he was basically saying, why do we want to connect everything? And I thought, like, well, do we? Who is we? We, like, as you, the technical community, we as users, who is we? Now, I really want to say, don't blame the user, because actually, it's the industry's fault. If you connect it, then we have to purchase it. So that's uh, 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 an approach I would take. And if you say, but Leonie, why? Well, there's enough research that shows us that, um, the, uh, for one, the user is not the enemy. It's actually, if you think about just the way we are structuring society, Nobody is expected to check a packet of crisp when you purchase it if it actually is going to harm you or danger you. You just assume the Food Standard Agency will solve that, right? Nobody is expecting to uh, be an electrical engineer in order for these lamps not to burst and like, completely uh, uh, destroy this room. So there are certain expectations we have as an individual towards a government, towards industry, that we have. But somehow, currently, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of booing there, but somehow the cybersecurity industry often gets an easy ride on that. Um, and I have a folder uh, that I religiously kind of update with uh, um, uh, slides, uh, not slides, but with pa papers, and my folder on culture of security, which is something around like why users don't do things or why users uh, or why even like companies um, fail to uh, do certain things is growing. And it evidently highlights that, you know, it's not about like shifting the responsibility to the individuals, but also it's structural issues that we need to address. And to showcase this, um, there's something called a privacy paradox. Now, don't get me wrong, um, it's very controversial, a lot of debates, a lot of publications, but I still want to highlight this because, A, it's something that next pub quiz you can answer a question on it, and B, because it's actually quite interesting because you will you know, encounter it quite often. And what the privacy paradox means is that um, people often say they, you know, they care about privacy, but what they do doesn't really go together. So for example, these are some studies uh, that I think are worth highlighting. So one is um, if you basically tell, stu uh, tell uh, participants that there is one store that values your privacy, others who don't, and there's just a one euro difference, people still go for the cheaper version. The other one is, for example, participants would easily sell their browser data. I'm sure that makes some of you get quite happy in this room, which is like for seven, pound, uh, for seven euros, 
they would sell their uh, browser data. And most recently, a colleague of mine, William uh, and, uh, uh, and, and all, have basically showed that this is also applicable, this privacy paradox, for the IoT environment. It's a really interesting paper if you have the chance to read it. So they did a survey and an interview, and they showed basically you know, that A, um, uh, IoT devices are perceived to have like, significant less privacy, but still people purchase them despite the fact they know that it's not secure or less private. And IoT owners also cared less about their privacy. It's like, you know, I purchased this and I just know that the companies will not care about my privacy, which is really an awful idea to think about. But that's how it is. But I do want to stress one thing. That does not mean that people do not value privacy. And that's a really false claim that I will, you know, disregarding all discussions you have with me, because there is severe cognitive problems with people, and there's enough research um, to show that, that they simply can't you know, make that judgment often. And it shouldn't be about industry exploiting this cognitive uh, impairment, okay? So I think that's the premise that I would like to start with. So okay, then you're gonna say, well, okay, we can't blame it on the user. What are the governance issues then? Well, I don't even know where to start. Um, there's so many papers out there. It's ranging from privacy to data protection, safety and security, like you name it. And in fact, because you know, I fought for uh, a keynote like this, I'm gonna make nice graphics. I just outlined some of the issues that we, you, probably me, I don't know, have to ensure, but certainly someone, um, when it comes to, for example, reliability, liability, access control, consent, uh, security and safety by design. So these are aspects that in the long run, IoT needs to guarantee and currently often does not. Now, this is a really nice uh, graph uh, by, uh, from 2018, which highlights what are actually the IoT security, privacy, and safety risks. And you really can nicely see how you go, for example, from the increased complexity, which is yesterday really nicely highlighted from like the Barbie doll and all the other devices that were carried out of uh, uh, um, the suitcase, to uh, down to the lack of knowledge. But I want to like, qualify here. Lack of knowledge of whom? Lack of knowledge of the industry actors, lack of knowledge of the users. So this is a widespread issue, right? Also to the kind of lack of incentives. Um, and of course, as industry actors, you would be saying, well, Leoni just showed me a study that users don't really are willing to purchase secure devices. And why should we then invest into that? Um, and then also a lack of monitoring enforcement, which is then basically where government and policymakers come in and basically say, well, if we can't incentivize that like uh, industry is really like ensuring or not exploiting that cognitive bias, perhaps we should uh, uh, make a baseline security uh, framework and privacy framework um, that will help users not to be uh, uh, used in this environment. Now, I really think IoT is a life cycle problem, and I'm sure uh, others do as well. So it starts from the design, the purchase, the setup, the maintenance, and the disposal. Now, over the course of the two days, I had a lot of discussion, and I realized I can't fill them in all, but there's a, con a couple of issues that connect to that. So for example, how do we ensure SMEs are supported? H what are we doing with open source project in this realm? Okay, how are we gonna ensure like, that, that they will be um, support, uh, that this will be supported? What are we doing about counterfeit product? Will we in the, sh in the future be leasing product then instead of purchasing? What about insurance in this space and also the right of return that was yesterday mentioned? So while I can't address them, they're food for thought, food for discussions over coffee, and there's, uh, I'm happily like, able to answer some of those questions around these in uh, the Q&A, but I think they're part of the life cycle problem that we have not addressed. Now, a really important aspect that I see in our research is in the current state of governance, but also in the current state of like, policy development, the majority of processes actually only look at the first three stages, as design, purchase, and setup. So they ignore the fact that what are we doing when users actually have implemented these systems, for example, in the built environment, but also what are we doing in the long run when they are basically purchased and you know, built in, and then they keep them for like 17 years because people don't uh, uh, change them. 
So currently, a lot of the best practices, a lot of the current like policy discussions do not, from my perspective, focus on the last three areas. I do want to mention, though, a colleague of mine, John Blythe, and others have highlighted, again, that was a responsibility for the user, what users can do. But still, I think there's a lot of uh, questions around these two areas where current regulation, or not even regulation, I don't say that word yet, um, but governance and policy measures are not going to. The other thing that I really want to mention is IoT is unique insofar it's not just like software, it's actually a thing. So we also have to consider product safety. Um, and you know, everything that like engineers have for the last like hundreds of years learned around safety, the standards that we have set up, you don't really have that for security. And that's the question where uh, we are always asking ourselves, is there a clash between safety and security standards? I always give the example to my students, if you think about a door, right? If you're an engineer from a safety perspective, that door should always be open. But from a security perspective, you want that to be closed. So how can it be, are you gonna be able to unify these different principles in the long run and ensure that there's standards that combine both? A big worry of mine, and I'm sure we have colleagues from uh, Amazon and Google in the room, uh, is uh, I personally see a lot of issues around centralization with technical standards. So if you think about it, if you're owner of Amazon Echo uh, or Google Home, you want to connect all your devices to that, right? So um, one big problem or issue that I can see emerge and will be a governance issue in the future is how are we going to ensure that like these hubs, these central nodes that IoT will create, ensure that there's actually an open flow of markets that like are not dominated by a couple of few people that set the standards, the technical standards, but also who allow who can connect to what. Um, and again, something that like I feel policymakers currently don't really think about because there's so much other things like burning in the back of their mind. I'm thinking of that image, I should have put that here with like the dog and the burning image. Yeah, should have done that there. Can't we regulate this is probably the question and uh, it's something that you probably don't wanna hear. Um, but let's be honest, national legislation will not solve this, no way. Why not? Because, you know, the market is not working like this. Um, even, I'm from Austria, even if Austria decides tomorrow that we're going to regulate certain aspects around IoT, we will have a bit of a problem like enforcing that. Um, and also, the big, big boo word is like, we don't want to stifle innovation. So, in that ecosystem that we're now, actually, this is not something that like is current a debate. Think back, 2006, I wasn't even at uni at that stage. Um, uh, they were, the European Union already um, had discussed, should we regulate IoT? Um, and by 2006, they basically, you know, because they really wanted to be the f at the forefront of like governance issues around emerging technologies. So it's not something really, I really want to emphasize this. This is not something, you know, everybody says, oh, IoT is so new. But to, since 2006, this is actually on the radar of the European Union. But the thing is, so these are two regulations or, or actually uh, uh, com communications that I want to point out. This is from 2008. So in 2008, after you know the first one, of the first meeting and workshop in 2006, the European Commission basically realized, well, um, we rather do self-regulation because this seems to be a bit, you know, too early stage, which we still say, um, and we don't want to intervene. By 2009, just one year later, the European Commission basically said, well, perhaps this is something we can't just leave with the uh, private sector. And now, you know. 20 years, no, 10 years, Jesus, uh, 10 years, <laughs> Whew. 10 years later, we're still having the same discussion, which I think is really interesting when you see how slow this uh, progresses. And in 2009, the European Commission also published like 14 lines of action. I reread them for the keynote and I felt like they could be published yesterday. You know, in those, four, like in those 10 years, we haven't really done much around the things that we like said we would do. For example, international dialogue. Of course we have chats, but that hasn't gone anywhere. So uh, just a bit of a critique there of like, uh, of uh, just like kind of conversation that we, and recitation of like the same dynamics over and over again, and I just wonder what needs to happen to actually then lead to something more concrete. So, and that's where I, I want to go on with. Will we, are we still set up for self-regulation? Self well, 
Again, our uh, Bruce Schneier um, is uh, of the opinion, you know, there's no industry that's ever improved safety and security without governance enforcing it. And I kind of agree with him, of course, because I'm a policy uh, 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 person. So uh, I strongly believe that we need carrots and sticks. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Carrots is something you lure someone and say, come, do a bit of better security and privacy. And if not, we come with your stick. Um, and I think that's what's currently needed a bit. Um, so uh, I think the European Union in this regard currently works on a bit of a stick, or actually the carrot, but perhaps they're gonna soon roll out the stick. Um, uh, so uh, colleagues of Inisa here probably, um, uh, they do incredible, great work. Um, this, uh, for example, the baseline security recommendation their annex is amazing. When I saw it, I was nearly crying because we do the same work and then we realized we don't need to do it anymore. Um, but like, it is a really good summary of what's happening in the IoT space and what could be important for uh, critical infrastructure providers. And it really goes nicely with, of course, what the European Commission is working on with the Cybersecurity Act. So if you have not heard about the Cybersecurity Act proposed in 2016, um, basically sets out a framework, uh, especially which I'm talking on second certification framework, around how we could ensure that ICT products are becoming more secure. Um, so I think the European Union is really at the forefront, but considering that they talk about it since 2006, I don't know, uh, 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 some uh, uh, actor that really tries to uh, dominate that field. Now the other thing, of course, I'm biased, I'm based in UCL in the United Kingdom, and we actually work very closely with the Department for Culture, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS. So we, for example, help them to write uh, a literature review of the current like, international developments around IoT, which ultimately fed into this nice publication called The Code of Practice for Cost, uh, Consumer IoT Products, which recently have become an Etsy standard. So any IoT vendors in this room could now certify uh, your products along those lines. Um, and what yesterday was not discussed is what this code actually encompasses. And it's 13 principles. Um, and um, it's, from my perspective, the low-hanging fruit, someone might say. But still, it is some start to basically talk about like, how could we ensure a more like, secure baseline for IoT uh, security. And the first three are currently actually being discussed uh, to be, become mandatory, but all the other principles will, if the government decides, still remain completely voluntary. And that's also something that uh, I need to stress with regards to the Cybersecurity Act. This is all still purely voluntary. So there will be no stick yet. Um, now, what happens with the rest of the world? Now, Yesterday it was mentioned the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, which uh, is a US legislation. Um, that's purely government procurement. That wouldn't affect like the average human being in the US. But still, it's a step forward. It's something where uh, you could see, okay, some people in the government in the US actually realized, perhaps you shouldn't implement it at least in our critical infrastructure. Um, and as always, Bruce Schneier realized quite early, that was in 2007, that when this was published, that this will go nowhere. And in fact, he was right. Because we had so far, every year, a new senator submitting the same bill over and over again. So we have now the third draft in the, sen uh, in the Senate. Um, we shall see if it goes anywhere. But it's still government procurement, but it is very interesting uh, and something you know, worth uh, checking out if you are based in the US. Similarly, California tries to press forward. Um, and yesterday, uh, Ken actually said, you know, this is something very positive. I'm, you know, I'm neutral targeted, but uh, there's a, a blog post by Graham Roberts, um, and he's very uh, against it. Basically, he says, and it's the same thing that like yesterday was discussed. It's not about like the, the claim in this three page document is basically there should be security features, but it doesn't really specify what are security features which makes it relatively difficult if you are a company and you don't really know what you should implement, right? So um, certainly something worth discussing, but it goes along with a very thorough, well, I assume very thorough review by NIST. So it will be interesting what publication they will come up with in order to support this bill. So these, I think, are kind of the current, like, three major developments that are, or four major developments that are happening. 
Now, interestingly, you might, as the CSER community, ask, wait, nobody is really in charge of this. Are we going to be responsible to fix that mess? Well, unfortunately for you, um, so you're definitely going to have to deal with the critical infrastructure if you are in the European Union, because the NIS directive, as you know, um, is uh, saying that, you know, certs are very important. And uh, there's also a lot of discussion saying that, you know, training exercises, issuing guidance, ensuring cooperation across borders, raising awareness, uh, and just like dealing with these nascent IoT risks will fall onto your heads, unfortunately. And uh, as part of the interviews that I conducted uh, last year, um, I also asked, like, my interviews always around IoT as well. And I felt there was two dynamics. One was that the majority of interviews always said, OK, we're just going to have to deal with the magnitude of IoT risks or risk in general. It's no longer just tablets, phones, or whatever. Actually, it's going to be our in connected hairbrushes and uh, fridges and whatever. So our constituency will probably become bigger. But um, my, a general sense I received was that it isn't really or wasn't really a topic that IoT was very big in the community and perhaps that's also why Andrew invited so many IoT speakers in order to make it a topic. The other thing is that uh, a lot of the interviews highlighted that uh, P-certs will become increasingly more important because of the IoT environment which is why I was really interested that like this year there's the first P-cert meeting happening. So I think that is something where perhaps like future meetups, uh, meetings of the P-cert community could go. Um, but often, unfortunately, that often requires a vendor buy-in that was uh, uh, not often very present. So these was kind of like uh, the findings that uh, I have seen when talking to the Caesar community around IoT. Okay, now you might say, that's all fine, Leonie. Okay, we see what's happening. The user's not their fault. What else is there? Well. In addition to kind of, uh, actually it should be voluntary, not mandatory baseline requirements. That was a wishful thinking um, uh, and best practices. There's three important things I want to highlight. One is certify. There's a lot of discussion around certification. Now, some of you might shrug and feel like, oh my God, that's awful. But um, others perhaps are feeling it more uh, in a positive sense. So by now, the discussion is purely around voluntary certification. So no need to freak out. But the question that remains is, how are we going to ensure dynamic certification? Because you can uh, think about like a toaster, you can test that when it breaks. How can you do the same thing with a smart toaster? How are you going to ensure that by the next software update, it doesn't you know, fall apart? Um, and there's four publications that I want to highlight. One is the overview of ICT certification laboratories. I think that was an attempt by NISA to map out who could do those certifications, probably. The other one is uh, a, a really nice paper on standard, uh, standard, sorry, standardization and certification um, by uh, uh, colleagues from Cambridge. I think they were all based. And also, of course, um, we have an own publication with Lloyds of London and Insurer, who are very interested in this space, but have the same problem. If there's no standards or ways of baseline requirements, an insurer would never ever cover that risk. So we actually did some kind of forward thinking um, scenarios that you're uh, open to uh, have a look at, where we also talk about how certification could look like in the future of a fully interconnected environment. Um, so that's around certification. The other big topic, in addition, when you think about, okay, we've certified it, couldn't we also label it? So um, there's a lot of research in this space, very exciting, uh, very current. Um, and again, this goes back to my argument that I said earlier. You don't, uh, you don't purchase a packet of crisp thinking, okay, I might die from that, but you know it's gonna be okay. So the same idea should be happening if you purchase this smart Barbie doll, that it tells you, well, it's internet connected and there's these kind of you know, uh, uh, problems with it because we have uh, tested it this way. So for example, uh, there's three studies that I wanna highlight. One is um, a very recent study, I think only a couple of months ago, which basically highlighted that users highly approve of 
labeling. They would really much value this, especially if it's done by third party like uh, independent organizations like Witch in the UK, because that would allow them to know when they purchase something, that product, you know, I can trust. The other thing is Baldini et al. highlight, for example, which dimension users would want to see when it comes to labeling. And that is a, a, a level of assurance, so what system it was tested on, but also kind of the domain it relates to, and then what certification type. Was it self-certification, third-party certification, which is all going to be important for uh, the forthcoming uh, aspects uh, in, in the European Union. And last but not least, Johnson et al. from UCL, they were also doing a lot of research around, like, are users willing to pay? And they are. But um, they also highlighted some of the weaknesses associated with um, the, these schemes, because, of course, you know, what are you going to do if people are, are involuntarily not able to you know, purchase smart devices? And I think that's a discussion around social inequality and equality that we need to have as well. So the second part, in addition to certification, labeling. And last but not least, the really, really bad word of liability. Ooh, no. Nobody wants to hear it, I know, but it is being discussed. So I just tell you that policymakers are discussing it. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but certainly people are thinking about it. Um, and that could take either the shape of like software liability so that Microsoft is at fault when it comes to uh, issues around updates, or actually, um, and perhaps that makes you more happy, it would be distributor liability. So it would be in the UK, for example, um, John Lewis, that they have a responsibility to take back if they have anything in store. Um, that is no longer secure, which would be, if you think about Amazon, a really big issue. So um, I'm not saying yes or no, I'm just saying, because this was a talk about IoT governance, this is being discussed. Um, and you might, so I also want to end on, uh, so these are all regulatory aspects or policy issues. But I do want to also say, I think, we haven't fully explored the full scale of technical aspects. So I want to highlight two projects that I am really interested in, I'm not part of, but I think probably interests the CERT community a lot. So one is a, a project by actually uh, Carnegie Mellon University. It's called Personal Privacy Assistant. And I really like the idea. It sounds super sci-fi. Um, and as a social scientist, I read those papers. And how I envision it is basically you have probably a smartphone and you walk around and this uh, this semi-automated configured system basically talks to all the IoT system and says, I don't like to share data with uh, third-party vendors, and I don't like my pictures being taken, and they basically switch those f features off, which allows personalized uh, ability for everyone to basically set the privacy standards that they want. So I think that's a really interesting paper, highly recommended, and something where, you know, finally we see a development if, like, how could we actually in this environment, this interconnected environment, allowed for personalized, individualized uh, uh, security, uh, or primarily privacy features. The other one is a UK-based project called Databox. And instead of having it in more kind of a, a dynamic way, this would basically be next to your router and protect whatever leaves your household, how data is being distributed. Again, a super amazing project, funded by EPSRC, um, done by colleagues in uh, Imperial in Newcastle, highly recommended. Um, I think that's, again, like a, a move forward to think about it, not just in regulation terms, but actually finding technical solution to ensure that like, the market can fix it itself. So um, I do want to say, though, um, someone will have to be responsible. So I don't know who, or we, we at this moment of time don't know who, but um, it certainly will be a mix between industry, politics, and society, and that requires us all having a proper conversation. Um, a lot of arguments are being brought forward in literature that you know, the World Trade Organization will deal with it, the OECD or the WEF. I personally um, have seen that in publications since 2005. I haven't seen anyone step up very much about it. Um, so uh, I have more trust currently in what the US and the European Union does. But I do want to say one thing. I think the CSER community has to join the debate, or fight, however you want to call it, because A, as I said, you're going to be probably the group that will have to fix it or deal with the mess that is being created. Um, and that's uh, why I also want to say, if you have 
because I'm a policy person, if you've never ever heard of submitting evidence to policy processes, it might be something you want to consider. Um, so for example, there's constantly uh, here, uh, consultations open in the European Union, but also in the UK and in other countries. Uh, a lot of your big corporations in this room, I'm sure, have policy teams that do that. But if you're smart, part of a smart, uh, sorry, <laughs> Freudian slip, um, uh, of, a, of a small company but have evidence that would be helpful and you want to contribute to this very contested but important debate, you know, you should really use your uh, a voice to influence the discussions around that. So, now this was, as I said, more of a lecture. I'm sorry, Serge. Um, uh, but I promise uh, we're close to the end. So, I hope I could basically highlight um, A, that IoT um, uh, matters, um, especially it doesn't seem to go away. It has haunted us since quite some time, since the 1990s as ubiquitous computing, 2006 when it starts to talk about regulation, until this point where we haven't really moved further in our debate, but ultimately still um, have uh, to seem to come to grasp with some form of uh, policy measures. Some policy and governance uh, developments are underway and happening. Um, and they are for quite some time. And I also want to say how, want, hope to have emphasized how the user fits in. I don't feel any of these um, uh, governance uh, measures really should push responsibility to the user insofar as we have evidence that they will not take it up. <laughs> so I think it is more important to look at like ways of ensuring that they are that the public is protected and our critical infrastructure is protected uh, in a systematic way than uh, shifting the idea to education measures which cost a lot of money and take a lot of time and rather implement something now, often technical, uh, partially also voluntary, mandatory regulation, et cetera, to basically protect the user in this environment. I think the CISO and PISA community will definitely have a big role to play. And that's, I think, why it's great to have a conversation around IoT. Um, and I really hope that you know, this gave you at least food for thought, some offense with when I said liability. Um, but at least like, you know that this is happening, and I'm sure you did before. But you now hopefully also know where it is happening and that you have the ability to intervene through submitting uh, evidence. And while I feel Ken lab yesterday ended on a very negative note, I, for once, and I never do that, end positively. I don't think all hope is lost. I do think there is a lot of development happening, again, for years, but still, there seems to be momentum. And I do think the time is right now before we really have these IoT systems in all of our houses. If we have those legacy systems, they will not go away. Now we can still intervene and make sure that they're not as horrible as they were this presented yesterday. So I think there is some hope uh, to ensure that, the, that they are secure. Okay, um, I wanna end by saying if this all somehow is interesting, I highly recommend having a look at the Petrus Internet of Things Research Hub and the work that we're doing. Um, there's a lot of industry stakeholders uh, part of it. I have to say I don't even know uh, how many already. Um, I also wanna end on a personal note as well. I'm talking here about like privacy and security in very general terms and mixing up like home usage and critical infrastructure. But one thing that personally keeps me rather awake at night is the evidence that these systems are actually abused in uh, domestic violence cases. Um, so um, I do think uh, that uh, there's an important discussion to have behalf around like the effect these systems have for some of the most vulnerable groups in society. Um, and I think it's not happening now, so it's great to have the opportunity to make this public here. So I think if we don't secure them for the sake of like, for example, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the average community, at least think about some of the most vulnerable groups that negatively are affected by the vulnerabilities that we put into those system. And um, I also wanna say, uh, I'm really interested in what's happening in everyone's country, so please speak to me if you have evidence that in Japan or in Korea there's more developments around that. And as I said, if you haven't replied to my email and have not spoken to us about the CSERT research before, I'd love to talk to you. 
On that note, um, I think I'm in time, actually ahead of it, which is unusual. Thank you very, very much. I hope this was interesting, and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you. Wow, I, I didn't know I was recruiting a motivational speaker. But I, I think that really was a call to action. Uh, we do have a bit of time for questions, if anybody has any. There are microphones, two at the front, and I think I can just see two there. I think we have a question. We have a couple of questions. So, Leone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That was amazing. Now, I don't know if everyone else saw this morning that a certain smart television had uh, put out a warning to its customers that they should be checking for virus updates on a regular basis. And apparently it took like 12 steps to get to that chest uh, to see. And you're like, well, who's actually going to do this? One of the things I'm wondering, you were talking about whether people were willing or not willing to pay for certain aspects of security and privacy. The balance as security people we've always fought against with the product people is usability and how easy something is versus how secure and private yeah. it is. And just wondering what kinds of aspects of that are you looking into and what are you finding? Yeah. Um, so uh, HCI research um, is where I would point to. Um, I feel like um, there's a lot of research showing that people are actually you know, not really willing to pay for it or they have a very low barrier to you know, being convinced that they should sell it. Um, but that's why the privacy paradox is there. Um, with regards to usability, um, I think uh, in our research we have um, a group um, that is uh, in Lancaster, um, which are amazing. They're thinking, uh, what they're doing is they think about the product and map back. That's what they called, uh, Jesus, um, design vision or future. And so, for example, they have a, a smart kettle. I know yesterday everybody was like really bad about that, but they have a smart kettle called Polly, and they're thinking about like how, you know, how expensive would that be? How, how would it look like? And then they map back what security features would we need to implement to ensure that. So, I mean, I don't know how your product cycles in your companies look like, but thinking about like what should be the end point and mapping back what could we achieve within the costs and everything Perhaps that is something, and there is research around that, and I can point you to a publication from Petras that I uh, would recommend. Good, cool. thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned food safety ratings earlier, and I thought that was really interesting because it, it addresses one part of the problem, for instance, the doll that came up yesterday. But there's another part that we as CSERTs often have to deal with, which is how a vulnerable IoT device can actually expose the internet to greater harm, because there's so many of them, a little bit like what we saw with Mirai. And I was wondering if you had any look at um, ratings related to the environment that we sometimes see on products and whether they work and whether there might be a solid implementation of those possible in IoT. Yes, definitely. So the publication, so the UK government, um, in one of the slides, I showed they had uh, recently a consult, or I think it's still ongoing, so it's still ongoing, um, a consultation around labeling, um, and uh, you can still submit evidence. And uh, we uh, actually, uh, so the, the Johnson paper I referred to, that's from 2019, they looked at uh, food, like all the labeling scheme. John had a really horrible time. Um, and uh, so John uh, actually looked at like food labeling, environmental labelings, and he did a very fair analysis of the pros and cons. Um, I can't remember from the report um, whether they were, it was better than food standard ratings, but uh, it's certainly in that report. Okay, cool. thank, thank you, you very much. I'm, I'm getting a head shake from the front, of, front row which suggests that the consultation is now closed. Yeah. Sorry. June 4th was oh, the last okay. Uh, hi, I'm Carlos with CERT Latvia. Uh, basically, I have two questions, short ones. Uh, so first of all, uh, like uh, those papers about how people value their privacy in 2013, wasn't privacy then like uncharted territory? Like, you know, if we ask people on the street today, like what do they think about quantum computing? Yeah. Like, nothing. Uh, and the second one, and, and like now, now since people feel how they are productized, they, that might change gradually now. And the second one is about, uh, uh, like the internet of shit, and I mean, like soon we'll have internet of old shit. Uh, like I don't expect to ch change my washing machine every three years as I do with my computers, and I don't know, like we'll have huge problems yeah. that we don't envision yet. Yeah. 
can you stay because I probably forget all your three questions. The first one was around uh, privacy. Privacy, privacy yes. like so. You're absolutely right. I normally never tend to use old uh, studies, um, and that's why there was three studies. So actually, the 2013 study that was. Um, uh, study uh, around a DVD store and about privacy setting, but still it was about like whether they valued like if they took notes of it, but you still see the same dynamic. I think it's about the dynamic and there are more, and I showed them current studies that okay. hide the same thing. So the IoT study is like published 2019 and they hide the same problem. So while I accept outdated probably, um, in 2019, there's still studies showing the same problem. Second question um, was around... Internet of all shit. That was tech question number three. Yeah. No, like I had just... Okay. The qu <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so uh, question number... Internet of all shit. So that's why I said leasing. You know, I think we're thinking still in terms of ownership. Now, if I'm talking, and we have a lot of industry stakeholders, and industry stakeholders are sitting here, there's an increasing shift, uh, at least I'm in London, so I'm writing a lot of tube, and there's an increasing shift towards leasing laptops, <laughs> phones. So while I'm not saying that the capitalist market structure changes very soon, I do think it could be, I have, no, like, I have arguments and papers around that, but no proper evidence, that it might be that like, your smart washing machine might be you lease it, and once it's outdated, Miele or Siemens will replace it for you. And that's part of the cost structure that you're in. Um, so I'm not saying this is going to be the fact, but this is one option that is being considered to deal with the out of um, the, uh, the, the legacy aspects around products that could be dealt with. Another issue is um, there's uh, a paper by Kleinhans. Uh, he's also cited. They show different options how we could deal with um, the outdated products, we could, which could be, for example, and I'm not sure that you're going to be happy with that, but that certain products could be made open source and you could maintain it yourself. But I'm not sure that the industry would go that way. But it's a thought. Doesn't sound like a great idea, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Wonderful talk. Enjoy it a Thank lot. You. For full disclosure, I am a vendor oh, and yeah. I'm making lots of stuff. So. Uh, when you are saying about, I don't know, safety and making parallel with security, it is good, but you are making it sound like security is the one thing. For safety, it's slightly easier just because we know, I don't know, it will burn, it will not burn. For security, slightly different. And also your parallel with the food safety. Again, the same thing will make us ill equally, more or less, everybody, all humans. The same thing in security will not affect everybody equally because we have different perceptions. So. Do you have any <coughs> research on, on what is, I don't know, acceptable levels of security for individuals, how they are rating it and why? So, so there is certainly, so, you know, when you said there's different ways of affecting it, you know, technically you could say the same thing. If you have a food allergy, it's going to affect you worse than me. So I think, like, you know, we could argue, we could have a good discussion over whiskey over that. I hope so. Um, so... I also, I'm going to be a bit uh, controversial in this audience. I also feel like, um, and that like, you know, the security sector often has an easy way out of it by saying, you know, we're new, it's different. But if you think about all the engineers that over, like how long it took to come up with standards in the engineering sector on safety, perhaps it will, you know, be something that in 50 years times we look back and be like, well, you know, we, we're refusing to, to go down a similar path. Now, you, you know, you, yeah, we, we can discuss that. Um, but I just want to say, you know, of course, it's like, early, like it's younger, it's security is not something, the community is not something that like is as long as engineering issues, building bridges or whatever. Um, so that would be one response. But there is certainly studies that look in like how um, security features um, could be, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, combined with safety. But the real problem is I still feel like there's not a lot of standards that combine them together. Okay. Um, and, and that's where I hope, like, there, there will be more developments around that. Okay. I hope that... Thanks. Okay. Uh, th thank you. My name is Samir from uh, Egyptian CERT, and I'm from Electrical and Electrical and Engineering, uh, yeah. UCL. Uh, first, uh, Thank you very much for this uh, literature in the review. Uh, from an academic point of view, it's very, very good. But you, speak, you spoke about the 
uh, slowly the regulation is going. But from my point of view, I'm asking you about this, uh, when the integration coming between 5G and IoT, and you know the, the big debate coming these days about the 5G, uh, I'm afraid to say that we have, I think, we have to have a big research about the integration between IoT and 5G and the security issues facing that. I'm afraid to say that maybe we face big issues before getting regulations about IoT and 5G. So do you have any uh, ideas? Uh, I'm not talking technical, as you said, but I'm talking about the research directions because totally different to talk about IoT independently from 5G, but the uh, divergence will be very, very big. Yeah. Um, so I have not much research into, like I, I haven't looked into 5G, um, but like if you think about it just as a policy issues, uh, a policy issue, uh, what increasingly governments, like for example the UK government, but also the European Union doing is like adaptive regulation, adaptive policy making, um, which is the idea that like um, you, you slowly implement certain measures and then see how it turns out and then you adjust it slightly. And that's why this is more tiptoe. We have more carrots than sticks yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Um, not all governments like go that way. I do think that sometimes uh, uh, it's better to do uh, a bit of like slowly tip tapping around it. So adaptive gov uh, governance would be in 5G would be A, investment in research to see how it turns out, yeah. um, small scale uh, implementations to test it in the real world environment, mm -hmm. and then uh, adopting around that, if that's if I were the UK government, yeah. um, uh, then, uh, or any government, yeah. and then seeing, okay, it worked there, how would it extrapolate into all those er uh, areas? So I have full control <laughs> over how this is being rolled out. That's, I would treat it like an experiment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much again, Leone. Um, <laughs> though I am intrigued to see what the author's view of the peer reviewer is. I'm a little older than the shown in the picture, um, but I did enjoy reviewing the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so we start again at 11 o'clock, so 35 minutes. Uh, with a full program of parallel sessions. Uh, the auditorium will do its special stuff while we're out and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>